Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Authorities in Oakland, California say that they are trying to identify and arrest a number of suspects this week following a brazen bank robbery in which an ATM was dragged down a road by a speeding van in front of stunned onlookers. According to reports, the situation took place at around 7.30 a.m. on January 21st when the crew of thieves showed up at a Bank of America branch on the 300 block of Hegenberger Road. After using tools to rip the bank's ATM from the wall where it was located, the suspects were seen tying a rope around it, which they hitched to the back of a white panel van. They then fled the scene, taking the unit with them. The crime apparently played out in full view of witnesses, at least one of whom captured footage of the ATM as it was pulled behind the speeding vehicle sending sparks flying all over the road. Police say that they have arrested one man in connection with the heist, who they have identified as Anthony Pearson. However, it's believed that three or four others were involved, none of whom have been named or arrested at the time of this recording. In addition to this, authorities say that they are investigating the theft of a second ATM, which was stolen roughly an hour before the heist caught on camera. That crime reportedly took place on Alameda Avenue, though it's unclear whether the same crew of people were involved. Police say that one of the two stolen ATMs was later recovered near a local Home Depot. So far, no information has been released about how much money was stolen between the two incidents. A pair of young Oregon boys are being applauded for their bravery and quick thinking this week after a woman stole their father's car with them inside and they managed to escape and call for help. The whole thing started at around 2.45 p.m. on January 22nd when the boys, ages 11 and 9, were with their father in Portland's Arbor Lodge neighborhood. The kids had just been picked up from school and were waiting in the car while their dad went to get their younger sister from her school when all of a sudden, a strange woman they didn't know hopped into the driver's seat. To their horror, she started driving the car, which had been left idling. The boy's father saw what was happening and tried to run back, but was only able to grab a door handle before she sped away. Though the terrified father raced back to the school and immediately got someone to call 911. According to reports, it was ultimately the 9 and 11 year olds who gave police the information that they needed. Roughly 10 minutes after being kidnapped, they seized their opportunity to escape and jumped out of the car when the vehicle momentarily came to a stop at a red light. They then flagged down a good Samaritan, who also called police. Authorities caught up with the female suspect a short time later as she headed north on Interstate 5. She refused to pull over, prompting a chase that involved multiple law enforcement agencies and continued across state lines into Vancouver, Washington. The pursuit came to an end near the Northeast 134th Street exit after police cruisers were able to pin and immobilize the stolen vehicle. The woman, later identified as 33-year-old Ayosha Deshay Millage, was then placed under arrest. At the time of this recording, Millage is facing a number of charges related to the chase, including attempt to elude, reckless driving, driving with a suspended or revoked license, and fugitive from justice. She is expected to face additional charges related to the actual kidnapping once she is extradited back to Oregon. Representatives from the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation say that a man is officially facing murder charges after the body of a young college student was discovered under disturbing circumstances last week. According to reports, the case began on January 17th when a tow truck company in Beaufort County received a call to tow a vehicle off a private parking lot in the city of Washington. A driver from the company did as they were instructed. However, things took a gruesome turn when they arrived back at their facility. In the trunk of the car, the employee found the body of a young woman. She has since been identified as 19-year-old Elizabeth City State College student Amariah Smith. After launching an investigation, authorities determined that the towed vehicle was owned by a 39-year-old man named Jordan Isaiah Thomas. Thomas was tracked down and arrested at the Eastern Carolina University Health Beaufort Hospital, after police located a second vehicle before that Thomas had allegedly stolen from the same spot where he dumped his car. At first, Thomas was charged with larceny of a motor vehicle and concealing the death of a person. However, following further investigation, murder charges were added on January 22nd. At the time of this recording, many unanswered questions still remain about the awful crime. 
Police say that they are still trying to confirm Amariah's cause of death, as well as the actual place where she was killed. Authorities say that evidence has been found at Thomas's home in Edmonton, about 50 miles away from where the body was found. However, it's still unclear if this was the main crime scene. Additionally, the nature of Thomas and Amariah's relationship is unclear, though police have said that they believe they knew each other prior to the murder. Friends and family members, meanwhile, say that they are mourning the 19-year-old's tragic death. She was a sophomore at university and was studying to become an elementary school teacher. The situation is still developing. Authorities in Fairfax County, Virginia, say that a wanted fugitive is finally in U.S. custody this week, nearly 33 years after he allegedly murdered his estranged wife and then fled the country to avoid facing justice for the crime. The case began all the way back on April 30th, 1991, when a resident in the community of West Falls Church called 911 to report a possible crime. The caller was a neighbor of 24-year-old Anna Hurado, and said that they had heard a scream coming from outside. Sadly, by the time police arrived, nothing could be done. Anna was lying at the side of the road, dead from a brutal slash wound to her throat, as well as additional trauma to her upper body. Tragically, she left behind three young children, including a daughter who was just seven months old. After beginning an investigation, detectives at the time zeroed in on Anna's husband, 24-year-old Jose Lazaro Cruz, Anna and Cruz were married, but were going through the middle of a contentious divorce. Though an arrest warrant was issued for Cruz within a month of Anna's murder, authorities soon realized that the 24-year-old had fled. They would later learn that he had tried to cross the border into Canada, where he was instantly denied before trying his luck south. He successfully made it into Mexico, and with the help of a smuggler, ultimately ended up in El Salvador. While attempts have been made several times over the years to locate Cruz, including one investigation in 1999 that apparently got close, none of these efforts resulted in his capture. That was until approximately a year and a half ago in 2022, when the then 58-year-old attempted to press his luck. According to reports, while traveling from Nicaragua into Costa Rica, he was recognized and arrested by authorities there. It's believed that he was trying to visit family. This week, it was announced that Cruz had been extradited back to the United States, where he will finally face justice for his alleged crimes. Currently, he is locked up at the Fairfax County Jail while he is awaiting trial. Authorities in Houston County, Alabama say that a 39-year-old woman is facing charges following a bizarre incident earlier this month in which she allegedly called in a fake crime because she was scared of the weather. According to reports, the whole thing started sometime on January 9th when police in the city of Dothan received a 911 call from a local woman named Kelly Carol Ginebra. The 39-year-old allegedly stated that she needed officers at her property right away because there was a burglary in progress. However, after responding to the scene, police quickly determined that no such crime was taking place. They questioned Ginebra, who allegedly revealed the truth about why she had called. She was scared of the bad weather that was going on that day and she wanted officers to come to her house quickly. While there apparently was quite a bit of rain and a couple of tornadoes spotted in the area that day, if anything, this is arguably all the more reason why Ginebra shouldn't have been wasting police resources. Unsurprisingly, she was arrested after admitting to the fake call and has now been charged with making a false report. A young Missouri student is reportedly preparing to sue his former employer this week after he and a colleague recently came to the aid of their co-workers during a terrifying robbery, only to find themselves unemployed afterwards. According to reports, the situation took place sometime last month when 20-year-old Michael Harrison was working at his Starbucks barista job at a location in downtown St. Louis. It was around noon, and Michael was manning the drive through at the business, when all of a sudden, two men stormed in and told everyone to get on the ground. They were wearing masks, and one of them was carrying what appeared to be a handgun. Understandably terrified, at first, everyone, including Michael, complied with the robbers' demands. A group of about 11 of them, consisting of 10 employees and one customer, lay on their stomachs while the two men started working on opening the cash register. Quickly realizing they were going to need assistance, the suspects told Michael to open the register. He tried, but was unable to, 
explaining that he didn't have the managerial credits necessary to do so. The 20-year-old turned to his supervisor for help, but they were apparently frozen in fear on the floor. That's when things reportedly escalated. According to Michael, as one of the suspects rifled through the supervisor's pockets, the second man hit him in the back of the head with the gun he was carrying. When he did this, another employee, Devin Jones Ransom, noticed that a piece of the weapon broke off. It was fake. Immediately after this realization, Devin attacked both of the suspects, with Michael quickly coming to his aid. The brawl continued out into the street, where an employee from a nearby store also noticed what was happening and came to help. The three workers were eventually able to restrain one of the suspects, while the other attempted to flee the scene. Both were ultimately arrested by police, and have now been identified as Joshua No and Marquise Porter Doyle. Following the incident, pretty much everyone applauded Michael and Devin's actions. The local community called them heroes, and police thanked them for their courage. Starbucks, though, apparently had a different view on the matter. They fired Devin and Michael soon after. According to Michael, initially, he didn't think anything was wrong. After the terrifying experience, the company put him on paid leave for two weeks. However, as soon as the media buzz died down, he received a call informing him that he had been terminated. He claims he was told he had violated company policy, but that he was not given any specific reason. After receiving backlash, Starbucks reportedly defended their decision, saying in part, quote, Partner safety is at the core of how we operate in our stores, and we are so grateful that our partners and customers did not come to greater harm in this situation. In situations like this, our training and protocols guide our partners to comply and de-escalate, not just for their safety, but for the safety of all in the store. In a recent interview, Michael told the media that he is in school to become an EMT, and he relied on his job at Starbucks to help pay his bills and tuition. He said the whole thing was very confusing and upsetting, stating, quote, I just don't understand it. I thought it was the right thing to do. In terms of Starbucks's supposed commitment to employee safety, Michael says this was far from the first dangerous situation he'd been subjected to at work. He claims the location he worked at was struggling with aggressive and violent customers for months. He and other employees made formal complaints to management, though he says nothing was done, stating, quote, People are always yelling and screaming at us, threatening to assault us, throwing things, trying to come up to us, but nothing was ever done. People have left the job because of it. Starbucks reportedly disputes these claims, saying that they temporarily closed the location where Michael worked to make improvements. However, it's unclear what these improvements were beyond telling workers that they could lock the main section of the store and limit customers to using the drive through at the time of this recording, Michael has reportedly retained legal counsel and is in the process of filing a lawsuit against his former employer. In a statement, his lawyer pointed out that Michael did try to follow the company policy at first, but that he was attacked, saying, quote, When the robbers came in, my client complied and tried to open the cash register when he was struck in the head by one of the gunmen. At that point, you're in a position to defend yourself. The situation is still developing. Authorities in Santa Clara, California say that a young Google engineer is in custody this week after he allegedly beat his wife to death inside their home hours after friends say they observed him acting strangely. The disturbing incident came to light on the morning of January 16th when police were called to a home on Valley Way in an upscale neighborhood of the city. They were alerted by a friend of the suspect, 27-year-old Lyron Chen, who had come back there to check up on him after some bizarre behavior the previous night. According to reports, the friend became concerned after having dinner with Chen and his wife Xuan Yi Yu at their home the night before. During the visit, the friend noticed that Chen was acting weird. He was quiet and appeared to be staring off into space for most of the evening. The next morning, the friend tried to call Chen to see if everything was okay. When he got no answer, he drove over to the house, only to encounter an unsettling scene. While peeking through a window, the friend allegedly saw Chen kneeling on the floor inside with his hand up in the air. Once again, he appeared to be staring off blankly into space. That's when the friend called police. When officers went inside the property, things quickly got a lot more disturbing. Chen was still kneeling on the floor motionless, and one of his hands was extremely swollen and purple. He, his clothes, and part of the room were splattered with blood. On the ground next to the 27-year-old was his wife, Xuan Yi. She was unresponsive, 
appeared to have suffered devastating blunt force injuries to her head and was quickly pronounced dead at the scene. When police asked Chen how he had injured his hand, officers say he replied, quote, I punched my wife. He went on to indicate that the attack had happened sometime the previous night. Chen was taken to the hospital shortly after this, and at the time of this recording remains in custody on suspicion of murder. It's unclear if he is yet facing formal charges. According to reports, Xuan Yi also worked for Google as a software engineer. Authorities in Will County, Illinois, say that nine people are dead this week, including the gunman, after a local man allegedly carried out a number of terrifying and deadly shootings, most of the victims of which were members of his own family. The incident began at around 4.20 p.m. on January 21st, when police in Joliet Township were called about a shooting on the 200 block of Davis Street. Officers arrived to find a man suffering from a gunshot wound who was immediately taken to a local hospital. According to witnesses, the victim was heading back to his home and was walking up his driveway when he was approached by a young man driving a red Toyota Camry. Suddenly, the driver fired at least nine shots, one of which struck the victim in the leg. Thankfully, the man's injuries were non-life-threatening. Disturbingly, though, this was only the beginning. Roughly 10 minutes after the incident on Davis Street, Joliet police received word of a second shooting at the Pheasant Run Apartments roughly two miles south. There, officers found 28-year-old Toyosi Bakari, who was suffering from a gunshot wound to his head. Bakari, a Nigerian immigrant who had been living in the area for about three years, was rushed to the hospital, though sadly, he was soon pronounced dead. Thanks to CCTV and witness accounts, investigators were soon able to link the two shootings. In particular, they learned that the same red Toyota Camry had been spotted near both scenes. The vehicle was linked to a 23-year-old man named Romeo Nance. After uncovering this evidence, authorities looked up Nance's last known address, which turned out to be about a 10-minute drive from the first crime scene. In fact, there were two addresses police discovered Nance could be at, both of which were located on the 2200 block of West Acres Road. Officers traveled to the location, arriving at around noon on January 22nd. They tried knocking at both residences and received no answer. However, at the second house, they quickly made an ominous discovery. On the front door frame, they spotted what appeared to be blood. Fearing that something was terribly wrong, officers entered the property where they made an awful discovery. The bodies of five people were inside, all of whom had died from gunshot wounds. Based on this, police went back to the first house where they discovered two more deceased victims inside. Upon further investigation, they learned that all seven of those in the two houses were relatives of their suspect, Romeo Nance. Two of the victims have since been identified only as his 14 and 16-year-old sisters, while the others were identified as his 47-year-old mother, Tamika Nance, his 38-year-old aunt, Christine Esters, his 35-year-old uncle, William Esters II, his 31-year-old brother, Joshua Nance, and another of his sisters, 20-year-old Alexandria Nance. It's believed that the seven family members were killed before the two shootings on January 21st. Alerts were put out for Romeo Nance and his vehicle, with the 23-year-old being spotted several hours after the seven bodies were discovered. By this point, Nance had reportedly made it all the way to the city of Natalia, Texas, just outside of San Antonio. Few details have so far been released about what happened from here, though Texas officials state that the 23-year-old was killed after turning his weapon on himself following a confrontation with police. At the time of this recording, much of the why behind the disturbing case remains a mystery. Authorities say that they do not know the 23-year-old's motive behind any of the shootings, though they believe the final two were completely random. The situation is still under investigation. Before we wrap up, We'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you'd consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. 
Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.